She's a physics grad student at UC Santa Barbara who's interested in the application of GPU accelerated parallel processing techniques uh, to traditionally speed limited problems in condensed matter research. Um, Somebody went to my old webpage. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I was like three years we old. We need to update that thing. It was like 2012, and I was like, I hope she's still interested in this. Um, <laughs> Every speaker should give like the, the organizer an introduction. <laughs> well, that's not so. fun. Then I, I got warning about this talk like only week in advance, and we have the biggest physics um, conference in, ever in uh, two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, so I know we're fast. We have the ETS marketing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So, we're <laughs> you move your laptop? You're in the I'm in the way. Thank you. Oh, you can turn it sideways. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, put it closer to here. Yeah, put it closer to the projector. Yeah. There we go. I don't have a clicker either, so I'm gonna have to. Uh -huh. um, so uh, her talk, which I'm sure she's gonna get into quite soon, uh, is uh, quantum statistical simulations with Julia. That's essentially what I was going to say. So. <laughs> um, so I guess I should preemptively apologize for not having as nice of a font or color scheme as the previous stuff. <laughs> that is really the bar high. A little hurt, actually. Sorry, I like the Q. Um, I'm into this Q as well. Q. Um, so yeah, uh, I am a grad student in the physics department at UCSB. Uh, I'm a condensed matter theorist. Um, so I don't know what that means. Um, most of our group. Uh, which is Matthew Fisher's group, um, now does computational condensed matter physics. So we take some quantum Hamiltonian, put it on a supercomputer, and try and find things out about it. Uh, the other person in my group is Jim Garrison, who's been really active uh, in like s solving bugs in Julia. If you follow the GitHub repo, you've probably seen constant emails from him. Um, so sadly, he's not here. Uh, but we're actually very into using Julia to do these kind of simulations for a variety of re reasons. Um, so what do I mean, first of all, by quantum simulations? Um, it does not mean having an actual qubit and just putting something on there. Um, we are all theorists. We don't actually like ever work with experimental labs at all. Um, we just sit there in a dark office and run things on computers. Uh, so what we want to do uh, in our group is use a classical computer to simulate some sort of complicated quantum system. Um, so the specific systems we're interested in are condensed matter systems. Um, you have some solid state system, there's a huge number of electrons running around in that system, the electrons interact with each other, and exotic things happen. Um, so in particular, for most of the problems we're interested in, classical mechanics doesn't work. Um, you can't treat things in even a semi-classical formalism, um, so you really have to use the sort of full feature set of quantum mechanics to learn anything. Um, and what that means is when you're trying to solve uh, for whatever the quantum system is doing, you have to take into account these octadiagonal terms in the action. Um, so what happens in a quantum Hamiltonian is that there's all these moves you can have now that are non-commuting, um, and this makes, in general, the problem really hard to solve. You're trying to do some huge like linear algebra problem, and now you have these terrible octadiagonal terms, and you're stuck. You don't know what the eigenbasis is. Um, so basically, all of computational condensed matter physics is find the eigenstates. Um, usually we only need one of them, the ground state, or for some other newer problems, uh, we need a bunch of states deep in the middle of the body band. So I've never understood this. Why is it that we're so fixated on the ground state? Uh, so the reason is that most interesting quantum phenomena are washed out by thermal effects okay. at high temperature, or high temperatures like above 10 Kelvin. So at low temperature, the ground state, <laughs> the ground state predominates. In fact, it's the only occupied state, um, and there you can have Phase, so most condensed matter physicists are really interested in phase transitions. Right. It's like our bread and butter. Right. And the only, not the only, but most interesting phase transitions are quantum. So the whole, the whole phenomenon is driven by quantum effects. Um, so in that case, you only need to treat the ground state. Okay. The other reason is that probing things other than the ground state with field theory is really hard. Um, so I guess we focus on the problem we can't solve. Right. Other than only, yeah. no idea what to do with. Uh, I mean, so for... For sort of these new, new non-equilibrium quantum systems problems that's changing, people are now very interested in systems where you really have to worry about a huge number of eigenstates at very high energies. Um, but yeah, the, the history of the field is basically get the ground state and we're done. Now you're um, getting the ground state is not easy, but once you have it, you're good to go. Uh, so that's basically my job, diagonalizing matrices. Uh, <laughs> really big matrices. Yes. Um, so there's many ways that you can try and do this. Um, so these are the three big techniques that our group uses. Uh, DMRG, which is Density Matrix Normalization Group. This is a technique that's exact in one 
and almost one day where you have like kind of a ladder of lattice sites. Um, this is really great. You write down some matrix product state that's your guess for a wave function, do a huge number of optimizations, and you have the ground state. It's exact. You can treat systems that are infinitely long. It's so wonderful. You can learn all about interesting lot effects in 1D. Um, so I don't really do a lot of DMRG. Jim does that. Um, and then I do these second two, quantum Monte Carlo, uh, which is applying regular Monte Carlo techniques to quantum systems, which is really hard because now you have off-diagonal updates. Uh, your goal is basically to, optim to import and sample a variety of things that will then get you observables. Um, so there's lots of different things you can use as your sampling basis in a Monte, in a Monte Carlo. You can sample guesses for your wave function, you can sample field theory diagrams, or you can sample pass-through considerations. Um, so what you do is you get some approximate guess for a partition function, make measurements, um, and again, you are done. And then the last thing you can do is just, just throw the Hamiltonian at an eigensolver um, and just exactly diagonalize, uh, which doesn't really work for big systems, but it's the best thing you can do if it's possible to do. So we're using Julia to try and tackle all three of these uh, methods. Um, so I actually have working code for the second two, and other people have been using Julia to write DMRGs. Um, and for a variety of, re of reasons, we really, really like doing it. Um, our lives have become a lot better since we started using Julia to do this. Um, the so offices aren't so dark anymore. <laughs> well, no, there's uh, we don't have we don't we're not like fancy like Stanford people. We don't have windows on our desks. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, so they're still dark, but I guess our hearts. Are Your hearts are lighter. Yes. <laughs> I don't mean to make this sound like everyone at UCSB is depressed. Um, <laughs> It's, it's simply that they just we're really excited about Julia. Julia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what is it about quantum simulation as a human problem that makes it hard? Um, so you basically have two options in, in condensed matter physics if you want to simulate something. You can go for a high performance language, which means C, C++, or Fortran, because these are the three languages that everybody knows that have MPI bindings. Um, but the problem is trying to teach someone C, C++, or Fortran is horrible. Uh, it takes a lot of people a long time to learn how to do things in C that are terrible. Um, and a lot of people don't want to learn C and C++ or especially Fortran. Um, so there's a big problem where you have all these people who very much like to write a code that runs quickly and can run on like a supercomputer, but they really can't um, because they're going to have to devote a year of their life to learning C++ and then still they're going to write terrible C++ code. Um, so your other option is to try something like Python, which has SciPy and NumPy, which is really great but Python is not very fast uh, for what we want to do. Um, that might change when the PyPy people finally implement NumPy, um, but I think that's not happening very soon. Um, and then the question marks are there because there's occasionally proposals from people that you should use Rust or you should use Go to do these like gigantic quantum simulations, um, but as far as I know, nobody in the scientific community that I know actually uses any of those things for this. Um, well, it's difficult to convince scientists that learning to program is even a use yeah. of their time. <laughs> Particularly anyone who's above a certain age, you know, they just sort of write the whole thing off. So. And if the linear algebra library bindings don't exist yet, you know, is yeah. there a good blast binding for Go? Is there a good blast mm -hmm. binding for Rust? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's an extreme rule. Yeah, it is, it is very hard to find either good MPI or good linear algebra libraries in anything other than C, C++, or Python. We'll be looking for a long time. So what we would really like in science um, is to have something that is performant but also easy to learn and easy to teach people um, because especially in my field of uh, hard condensed matter there's a lot of problems that you really can't tackle with pen and paper methods at all anymore um, and there's going to be a lot of people who need to learn how to program and they're going to need to learn how to program well because when you're actually trying to solve some of these systems you have like a matrix that's two million by two million you have to find the ground state. That's hard. Um, you can't just like throw something at the wall and hope it sticks. Um, you will never ever publish a paper trying to do that. So you have all these students who need to learn how to program, and they also need to write stuff that's not going to be terrible. And we really think that Julia can fill that space. Uh, and particularly, the thing we like most about it is that there's kind of an 80-20 principle going on here, <laughs> where like 80% of the people need 20% of what MPI can do. Um, I don't know how, how many people here have ever used MPI. Um, so if you don't know what MPI is, uh, which maybe you don't, uh, it's basically 
a, a paradigm for dealing with distributed memory supercomputers. You have nodes, they have separate memory, and then they pass envelopes full of information to each other. Um, and it can be as low level as you want, uh, but it's often hard for people to reason about. Um, and it takes people a long time to learn, and there's all kinds of performance gotchas with it. And most people don't need most of the MPI features. Um, they really just need to be able to like have node A know what node B's variable is. And Julia provides that functionality in a very, very nice package. Um, it's also faster than Python, um, but it's just as easy. In fact, I think for a lot of people, it's easier to learn because it's in some ways like MATLAB, uh, which they usually see in their undergrads for doing these linear algebra problems. Um, another thing we really like is that it's easy to represent and talk about the algorithms we use in Julia. Um, people often get shown like what is what is quantum Monte Carlo? How does it work? And then they look at it and they look at it and they look at it and they've got this like 5,000 line C code in front of them. They're still looking at it and they really have no idea what's going on. And Julia, you can take that 5,000 line C code and you can turn it into a 200 line thing that makes sense. And it's full of things like math that humans actually understand. <laughs> uh, I don't like programmers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, so I, I should also, but I like C++. Uh, most of my code is actually in C++. Probably some of you will hear that and be like, this person's insane. <laughs> um, but I, I do like C++, um, but a lot of students do not like it or are never going to like it. And there should be an option for them to be able to actually get work done. Um, and the other thing is that it, it's very hard, well, it's not very hard, but it's harder to accidentally, as the quote goes, blow your own leg off. Julia, um, do something horrible, accidentally overwrite the virtual function table. Um, <laughs> or all the other things that you can do with C and C++ that people don't understand you can do until they do them. And then they're like, why did six months of work go down the drain? Uh, and the other thing is we, I mean, as you said, most senior people do not really want to learn programming. Um, trying to sit down to your advisor and explain that your code doesn't work because you didn't understand loose semantics in C++ is not a winning strategy. Uh, <laughs> or maybe, well, if you have a particular kind of advisor, maybe it is. Uh, <laughs> but most, most scientists don't ever want to have to deal with that. Most of them just want to write something that will run quickly, um, that, they can iterate quick, that they can iterate very, very, very quickly um, to determine if they actually programmed the right model, or whether the model they're interested in is actually interesting to anyone else. Um, and once they've done that, then they can worry about other things. Uh, but the thing we really like about Julia is that since it's designed for scientific computing, it really kind of addresses most of the pain points that scientific people have with programming. Uh, the other thing we really like about it um, is that there's a really active development community. If you need something to happen, it's very easy to get it usually. Um, so for instance, one thing that I know our group is, and many others are interested in is Petsy or Slepsy support um, in Julia. So if you don't know what those are, they're very, very old and very, very massive um, linear algebra and uh, finite element analysis solvers. Um, so you, you can give Petsy like 10,000 supercomputing nodes and a matrix that's 2 million by 2 million and ask it for things about that matrix, like its eigenbasis or eigenpairs or something like that. Um, so this is something that's actually really commonly used in a lot of applied math and um, some physics communities. And it's something that would be really great to have in Julia. And there is actually an active issue on GitHub with people talking about how to put this in, um, which is really, kind of, which was very surprising for us because usually the experience you have as a computational scientist is you go to someone and you say, hey, is it possible to have this? And they're like, no. Someone tried to do it 30 years ago in Fortran, it's not happening. Write it yourself. And then you go home and you say, but the NSF won't give us the money to write Fortran libraries. <laughs> they want to see phase transitions. Uh, the other thing we really like about actually is all of the parallel features, and there's more coming every day. Um, so most of the problems we want to handle cannot be a, a touched at all on a serial machine. You just cannot attack any of them with your workstation. You really need a supercomputer to get anywhere um, with these problems. Uh, and on that front, Julia is really great. Um, the whole paradigm of how you actually handle a cluster is so much better than dealing with any of the C or C++ based stuff that exists right now. Um, it's so much less painful to, for instance, load balance something. Um, and 
from my perspective, the GPU support, which is very, very minimal now, but improving every day, is actually a really great feature of Julia. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw this, but there was a project that somebody posted on HN about compiling Julia kernels for the GPU. Um, so, if you've never done GPU programming, you have to compile a little kernel in C or C++, and that gets sent to the GPU and it executes it. And to do this, you need to have LLVM bytecode that's actually pushed onto the device, and then it runs it, and some stuff happens, and there's some black magic in there. Um, but somebody's actually written uh, the LLVM interface with the back end to allow you to write Julia-based kernels for the GPU, which from our perspective is really, really great because having to write the C version is awful. Um, and all of the GP, GPU support we found in, in Julia um, is just so much, there's so much less stuff going on. Um, GP, GPU in C and C++ really has the like classic C and C++ problem where there's a lot of boilerplate you have to write before you can actually do anything. Um, and the support in Julia totally removes that problem. So how does it compare to something like CUDA, say? So it's all, it's all based on top of CUDA. Okay. Um, like it, there's a bunch of wrappers. It's actually another one of these like 80-20 things where they wrap like the 20% of the functionality that 80% of people are going to use in a nice Julia interface. And it's like wonderfully integrated so that um, like it, the parallelism of Julia has a task queue, right? So whenever a worker becomes free, he gets allocated a new thing to do, right? So the GPU support is integrated with that, so that when one, one kernel finishes, another CUDA stream is called to take the next kernel, or to do the memory transfer or whatever, if you're not using unified virtual addressing. Um, so it integrates really, really well with the existing parallel features of Julia, um, and it's not like painful to use. <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that's really great about it is that um, there's actually Although Julia's message passing paradigm is different than MPI's, there's already a set of wrappers that will let you use MPI in Julia if you need to do that. So, for instance, if you want to call something like in C that needs a bunch of MPI nodes, like not Julia nodes, but specifically MPI, you can you can just give it a blob of MPI nodes that are controlled by Julia, C call on those, do the thing, get the answer back, and then continue with whatever it was you were doing. Um, which is really cool. And the other uh, package that we're really excited about is HDF5 integration. Um, if people who know HDF5 is a file format um, that's used for really, really big data applications. You have some huge, like, terabyte sized matrix and you want to store it in memory. Um, how do we do this? You can do it with HDF5. Uh, and Julie's HDF5 support is really great. Uh, the one thing it does not support yet, which I really hope is coming, um, is parallel HDF5, which allows you to have a bunch of nodes writing the same file at once. So hopefully that will exist soon. So like I said, most people don't need this two-sided message passing interface. Like the huge amount of stuff in MPI is not needed by most people. Um, and it takes forever right now to teach somebody coming in to grad school or like some new professor how to program. Um, most scientists are not interested in learning to code. If they were interested in learning to code, they would have been CS majors, but they're physics majors. Um, you know, they just made a mistake. You know, in graduate school, how much of a mistake they made? Yep. Pretty much. So, and, and teaching someone to, to do this well is really hard with the existing tools we have. Teaching someone how to not do buffer overflows and their MPI all reduces in C <laughs> is, is a real pain. Um, these people don't know that buffer overflows exist. And it would be better maybe for everyone if they never had to find out. <laughs> <laughs> and Julia allows them to do that. And the other thing that, that is also really exciting about it is that Like the hecklers up here. <laughs> no, never. It, it's fine if you heckle. It's just when you whisper, I get worried. Oh, I just, it's, it's such a rite of passage to experience these things. Yeah. <laughs> the moment when you find out that Boom Killer waits in anticipation on your code. Uh, the other thing that we're really excited about is that there's going to be a lot of support for running on a variety of clusters. Uh, it's a common experience, at least in our community that you have access to five supercomputers, and one of them is running like Xeon 5, one of them is running some AMD processor, and one of them has Infiniband, and the other one does not. 
Um, and one of them has XFS and the other one has NFS and this other guy has Lustre. Um, and you, you don't want to deal with that. You just want to run your job and write the files and process the files and then you're going to be done. Um, yeah. Because you, didn't, you, just, you especially did not go to college to be a file systems major. Um, <laughs> and Julia, we, we think, is actually going to really take away a huge amount of the unpleasantness that exists in scientific computing right now. Because a large part of doing scientific computing is just dealing with the fact that things are different for stupid reasons in a variety yeah. of places. Um, and it's just going to smooth over all that roughness. Uh, and it's going to allow us to write code that's still very fast, but it's easier to understand, and we're going to be able to investigate a lot more problems much quicker. Um, and the other thing is we're also all very excited for compiled binaries whenever that's happening. Um, there's a rumor, or I guess a plan, that there will eventually be not just just-in-time compiled Julia code, but like actually compiled binaries that you can just run somewhere. Um, so we all hope that happens really soon. I think the target release for that is not uh, the next stable version, but the stable version after that. Yeah. So it's on. It's on the dock. Yes. Yeah. So in summary, um, we're like really excited, and we're evangelizing scientific Julia to a lot of people, um, just because it's it's made our lives so much better. Um, and we're really also excited about the stuff that's going to happen in the next year in the language. We're hoping that there will be parallel HDF5 support. Um, the GPU support, we hope, is also going to be much, much better. Um, I mean, it's already good, but there's a lot of things that can be improved. For instance, there's a lot of things in the CUDA BLAST library that are still not in the Julia um, CUDA wrappers, which wouldn't be hard to do, but once they're there, it will be wonderful. Um, and a lot of these parallelism features will make my life specifically a lot better, um, which is why I'm so excited about Julia. So, yes. Questions? Sorry to ask this question, but it doesn't fit anywhere else. Uh, what kind of support does Julia have for special functions? So there's actually a lot of special yeah. functions. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of them, and they actually just added like a bunch more. Okay, I'm sold. Where, so, do, do, I, where do I have to what, sign? What, what, actually, what do you mean by special? Uh, so I, I think it's like, so the GNU scientific programming like library is a, is a very good example of uh, of a, a, a suite of a lot of just special uh, mathematical functions. That's you know best one for sphere a lot of right right right. Uh, what have you? Um, and just impl efficient implementation of those. And so there there are many 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 um, just packages that people have made to to wrap the libraries that already exist for that work. And and if and I, like I was talking to you earlier before the talks. Um, the cool thing is if for example um, you know. Uh, most people don't need 80% uh, of the MPI stuff, but like you're the you're the one person that does, um, then it's not it, it's not an arduous process for you to call out um, to MPI directly right. yourself. Yeah. Um, packages generally make the syntax like a little bit cleaner and more uh, carry more semantic weight, um, but in general, it's it's still like one line of code to do, um, and it's pretty nice. You should be asking for for people's uh, firstborns, you know. What do you have, children? Because this is really good. <laughs> <laughs> we like, no, we're making we this. Give us no. your firstborns. All you can do is contribute back. Yeah. That's all you need to do. Contribute yeah. back. If you like it, contribute back. That, no, that 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 is a that is very easy. good. Uh, and you yeah. say the code base is in uh, GitHub. It's yeah, yeah, and, okay. almost, and and I was about to ask you. You said you had um, code for exact diagonalization. Monte Carlo is that is that uh, publicly available? Um, so it will be once I make it less gross. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, I need to put in some comments, and things, but there will be an I Julia notebook. Uh, just just push it and let other people make it less gross. Yeah. Um, That's what it is for. Um, <laughs> so I actually had a comment since you know this is touches a bit upon you know scientific computing and, and all that. How do how do we actually you know, teach scientists to code well? What, what was your what was your experience learning to code, and having gone through that experience, how can we teach other people to code better? So I don't. So I should I should 
put out first that I think my experience was kind of pathological and that you should take too many lessons from it. Because I learned how pointers in C work by learning how to program in the GPU. Um, which is, yeah, it's, it's not normal to do that. Don't do that to someone. Um, and do you feel stronger because you did it? I mean, maybe. Okay. I, certainly, I certainly feel crazier. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I certainly understand pointers now. I mean, that's definitely true. I understand like how pointers work and what a reference is and all that. Uh, but it was definitely a very steep learning curve. Um, I actually had never programmed before I went to university, which I understand is an atypical experience for people who become computational scientists. Um, but it's not an atypical experience for women who do it. Um, so and also physicists. Yes. Um, in general. Yeah, most physicists don't don't code before they go to university. I think, but those those who are coding before university tend to focus more on computational science. Um, my experience learning was that we did C plus plus first, and I really liked it. Um, which again, I assume is not normal. Um, <laughs> many people don't have that experience. Um, and then later on, I took a bunch of uh, classes that were not about computational physics. They were about computational PEs, but I liked it. And then I did a research project. Um, and I was almost entirely self-taught. Like I didn't, I didn't take classes in CS or anything like that. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I have any valuable advice on how to teach scientists to code. Um, I bring it up primarily because it, it seems to be obvious that there is just a huge gaping hole in that we have these people who are doing computational physics and they don't know how to program and unless we're willing to admit that a physics PhD now needs to take like 10 years in which you spend two or three learning how to do coding exceptionally well, yeah. then we need to solve this problem and very quickly. It'd be nice if we could figure out how to teach people this code. Right. Uh, <laughs> I, I, so I'm, I, I mean, I was a CS major, I'm a software developer, and like, even people who are primarily in computer science programs <laughs> sometimes <laughs> learn how to code, sometimes no, not. I mean, they call like, it theoretical, at least in computer science. For, you know, yeah, I mean, even, but like, even, yeah, especially if you want to talk about like writing good code and writing code that's like useful to other people, like, it would be nice if anybody knew how to teach that to anyone, let alone physicists, oh. who are not otherwise interested. Right. So that's this is this is like a, a huge unsolved. It's a problem for society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 education research. Yeah. 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 And there are organizations that are now trying to make it easier to onboard people to yeah. okay. well, learn. It's not that hard. Come on, people go through it. So I, I think I think a large part of the problem can be reduced to just looking at uh, the motivation for people to learn to code. The um, the problem space is such now that uh, it's quickly approaching the point where to be productive. Uh, at all to get useful numerical results, you have to be at least somewhat uh, proficient in using a computer to do that work for you. Um, and so, uh, in general, I think people are realizing that and also realizing that there are tools out there to make it easy for them to reach that level of proficiency uh, much more quickly than the technology has allowed in the past, um, which is basically what you were talking about the whole time. Um, I think Julia is specifically at a good, um, in a good position to take on uh, that role in a similar, a similar role to uh, uh, the role that Python has uh, in uh, scientific programming education. Right now, Python uh, specifically, like you know, it, it's pretty interesting to, to to look back at the evolution of Python as a language and see um, just how readily the scientific community kind of adopted it and picked it up because it was a high level language that you could just use easily and look all you have to do is like define all this all the wrappers to the C libraries that nobody wants to ever look at anymore and like we can get people to actually produce um, code that is reasonably efficient and useful and quick to write. Um, the other comment there though uh, and Jared, have we reached like the interactive session now? I guess we are. We're in the interactive session. I'm just the only one staying. <laughs> so, maybe we should thank Catherine again. So I think, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea. <laughs>
guess it's, it's the interaction session. So